Perfect. So good morning, everyone. I'm calling our Workforce Development Board meeting to order at 10.05 a.m. And uh, before we get started, we're going to go over some of the meeting process for today. This meeting is being conducted on the Zoom platform. Only board members and staff are on the Zoom meeting itself. The public can view this meeting via live stream on our Workforce Development YouTube page. A link to the YouTube page, meeting agenda, board packet information can all be found on our California Workforce Development Board website at cwdb.ca.gov under State Board Meetings and Archives. A recording of this meeting is going to stay on our California Workforce Development Board YouTube page. Public comment is now open and will be accepted via email at boardpublickcomment at cwdb.ca.gov. All emails will be read aloud during the public comment periods noted on the agenda and will be included in the meeting minutes as part of the public record. We can allow just three minutes for each comment, so please make them concise. Uh, um, please uh, have all uh, board members and participants st uh, stay on mute. And if you uh, would like to speak, I'm happy to recognize you. Uh, you can either use the raised hand feature or type speak into the chat function. You can also directly type in your question in the chat and we'll uh, try to get to those as well. Please note that anything that is typed into the Zoom chat box will be included in the meeting minutes as part of the public record. So as uh, our executive director, Mr. Rainey indicated earlier, we do have a quorum. So uh, our uh, first portion of our agenda is action item, uh, the consideration of approval of December 1st, 2021 meeting summary. The meeting summary can be found on page four of our packet. So are there any questions or comments from the board? Is there any public comments that were submitted? No public comments at this time. Thank you. Uh, we can entertain a motion. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Motion by Jamil. Second. Second. Second, <laughs> Gloria, I think. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any abstentions or nays? Okay. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Uh, we'll now proceed to the next agenda item, which is recommend approval of the LA County Foothill Local Area Modification. This item starts on page 29 of your agenda packet. The governor has the authority to modify local workforce area jurisdictions. This is a process that EDD uh, receives a request from a local area uh, for modification request. In this case, the city of Monrovia is seeking to leave one local workforce jurisdiction, which is Foothill, and join another, uh, which is LA County. LA County submitted the request for modification to EDD back in October. EDD, EDD then provides an analysis of the impact of the change, including on job seekers' ability to access services and make a recommendation to the board. The board must formally approve or deny the request. Uh, at our February 2nd meeting, our executive committee did review this and, and did uh, recommend approval. The recommendation here Overall is to approve the request for modification and forward the item to the Labor Secretary, uh, Natalie Pelugii, for final action on behalf of the governor. Before we take the motion or consider it, uh, Marissa Clark on our staff is gonna provide an overview and she will take any questions. Marissa. Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, so just real quickly, the state, um, as was said, has a policy directive that outlines the formal process for undergoing a local area modification um, that Chairman Brook just briefly went over. And a key part of that process is the in-depth analysis conducted by EDD. That really helps the state determine whether to approve or deny a modification request. So the entire analysis is contained in your agenda packets if you wanna kind of go more in depth, but I'll briefly touch on a couple key highlights. Um, one, an analysis of the, of the CalJobs participant data indicated that LA County local area currently spends more WIOA training funds on residents of Monrovia than does the Foothill local area. Uh, number two, currently residents of Monrovia must travel to Pasadena or West Covina for in-person WIOA services. And the LA County local board has discussed placing WIOA Title I staff at the Monrovia Community Adult School to allow for greater access. And number three, that three cities within the Foothill Local Board Consortium have formally supported the modification request. 
So we also have Anthony Crouch with us today who authored the very well-written analysis in your packets and he can help answer any in-depth questions you have. Um, Anthony is a regional advisor for these local areas and was extremely instrumental in helping us keep this process smoothly. So a big thanks to him um, and happy between Anthony and I to ask to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Marissa. Anthony, is there anything you wanted to add before we took questions? Uh, no, I'm just ready to take questions if anyone has them. Okay, uh, so any comments or questions from board members on this topic? Um, Chair, can, can I move approval? Uh, sure, before we do that, uh, I wanna check on uh, our, if there's any public comments that have been submitted. No public comments. Okay, so we have a, a motion uh, from Joseph for a, a approval. Are there any seconds? I will, I will second. Annette seconds it. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any, thank you. Are there any abstentions or nays? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Uh, before we proceed further, I want to uh, acknowledge that we have our new EDD director that was appointed by Governor Newsom, Nancy Farias, here joining us. So if you, uh, we welcome you, Nancy. Thank you so much for stepping up and uh, your service during this critical time. Does Nancy have much. to do a, does she have to do a speech, uh, Mr. Chair? I do them every day in front of the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I mean, I, I will just say 30 seconds. Um, you know, the last year and a half that I've been at EDD has been, you know, overtaken by UI. So I actually look forward to something other than UI on my calendar and on the agenda. So um, I'm more than happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Your collaboration uh, with our workforce system is, is vital and we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Uh, director. So uh, we'll now proceed to our updates and discussion section, uh, beginning with our labor agency update. And uh, Abby Snay is here on behalf of the agency. Thank you so much, Angelo. And I know I speak for all my colleagues at the labor agency about how thrilled we are to have Nancy in this role and to have her leadership. And for any of you who tuned in to the assembly budget hearing yesterday, she did us all proud, um, responding to some really um, challenging questions, but um, it's just great to have you in this role, Nancy. And um, as an update, um, I can focus on the budget, proposed budget investments um, in the governor's budget for 22-23. And Miranda, if you don't mind sharing that screen, um, I can go through these pretty quickly at a high level. And then since so many of these budget proposals will go directly into the state board, um, Tim will give you more, more depth and detail on them. And um, Tim, just feel free to jump in if, if, if you want to, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. So um, if you don't mind um, advancing, thanks, Miranda, that's perfect. So the governor's budget really had significant um, investments proposed for the labor agency. Three of those clustered around um, workforce in three major initiatives, one on healthcare workforce um, in close partnership. And I, I think what can be a historic new um, collaboration with the Health and Human Service Agency, a cluster of investments that really address climate justice with um, many of those going through the state board and several investments proposed to um, really address the immigrant workforce and um, really do have the state do more to tap the knowledge, skills and experience of our, our immigrant and refugee workforce. And then there are two sets of investments that um, will transform unemployment insurance and continue to um, strengthen EDD's UI work and um, in increase the state's protection of its workers. So next slide, please. So in healthcare, um, the overall um, Healthy Workforce for All initiative that will be run jointly, as I mentioned, with Health and Human Services is a total of $1.7 billion with about 12 different program components. 
three of those go directly through the labor agency and the rest go um, through health and human services. And those include a large nursing initiative, uh, um, building out training for community health workers, you know, who will soon be covered under Medi-Cal through CalAIM um, and um, other programs through HCI to support the integration of English language learners to support um, residencies in psychiatry, um, to develop a new social work um, pathway to get to master's level social work. Um, and those are all on the CHHS side. Within the labor agency, we are very excited about um, $90 million proposed that would go to the employment training panel to support, support both entry-level employment and career advancement for workers in health and human services with 40 million of that called out for social work settings. As many of you know, this is particularly significant because the ETP fund does typically not include um, many healthcare employers who just pay into a different UI fund or self-insure for unemployment insurance. And so this really opens up um, participation into ETP training for many of the state's high road healthcare employers um, who otherwise couldn't access training. So very excited about that. And then um, 60 million over three years is proposed to um, increase the training of emergency medical technicians who are in short supply around the state with a focus on opportunity youth, on youth who have been just as involved to replicate the very successful program that Alameda County has run for about 10 years now. Um, and, um, and then 340 million um, that will go directly to the state board to increase HRTPs, high road training partnerships in healthcare, um, likely with a focus on the allied health and health technology roles, those roles that um, in healthcare that do not require a four year degree, but can really create pathways to family sustaining wages. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Miranda. And then there's a group of proposals um, for climate justice. And I'm gonna let Tim go into more detail on most of these, especially the Goods Movement Training Campus at the Port of LA. Um, there will be, we hope, assuming approval, 50 million going to EDD's Workforce Services Branch to really supplement federal sources of support for dislocated workers to target the needs of oil and gas workers um, who have lost their jobs, um, both in terms of support for future training, as well as income support and um, a range of support services. There will also be 15 million, um, again, pending approval to the state board for the well capping workforce training um, pilot program. Tim, I know you're going to go into more detail there, as well as 60 million over three years to really restart the um, board's grant program um, that was aligned with the Air Resources Board Climate Change Scoping Program. Um, let me go to the next slide. And I'm zipping through these so you can give more detail, Tim. And then under the um, Immigrant Workforce and Economic Mobility Cluster, um, we're anticipating 30 million that will go via the Workforce Services Branch of EDD to accelerate and expand the use of integrated education and training for English language learners who are either not yet in the workforce or in low wage jobs. And as many of you may know, IET as it's called um, is, is best known through the Washington State IBEST model, which is an approach to skills training for English language learners that um, really disrupts the traditional way of doing training sequentially where people have to get to a certain level of English to be able to participate in, in technical skills training. In the IET model, these, these um, English language training contextualized ESL is incorporated into technology skills, the technical skills training in any um, 
sector or pathway. And that can be done through team teaching, that can be done through um, shared curriculum, that could be done through a three day, two day a week schedule. Um, this is a very well researched training modality, which really accelerates learning and employment. And we're very excited to work in partnership with uh, adult ed at um, the Department of Education and the Ch Chancellor's Office to really accelerate um, learning for English language learners in the state. Um, and in addition to the $30 million here, the healthcare initiative includes another $130 million of Prop 98 dollars also to increase access for English language learners. And our goal is to really um, align these two sources of funding. That 130 million will focus, of course, on, on healthcare. Um, there is also $20 million proposed um, to ETP to build out workplace literacy and really focus on um, English language acquisition, um, technical skills training, digital literacy for English language learners at the workplace, both to um, build businesses, um, enabling businesses to build the skills of their workers and creating more pathways for English language learners. And then going through the state board um, should be 10 million to develop a language justice pathway through the California Youth Leadership Corps, which is a partnership with selected community colleges, now five around the state, that identify um, youth um, who are either already in community college or recruiting them to the um, community college um, and to tap their passion for social justice, for climate justice, for um, immigrant justice, and um, to support internships at um, legal services organizations to immigrants combined with academic training, um, including the Department of Justice interpreter certificate. And this not only increases the pool of people able to do interpreting at legal um, services for immigrants organizations, um, but it really puts young people on pathways to law, to paralegal work, um, and other social justice work. Um, next slide, please, Miranda. Thank you. And then Nancy can speak more to this, but you can see um, the governor's budget also proposes um, significant resources to pay down California's debt um, for unemployment insurance and to continue enhancing um, EDD's ability to combat fraud, um, to build out its cybersecurity and to support its um, command center division. Just going through these quickly. And next slide, Miranda, this will be the, the last one. Um, and then for worker protection, support to the division of a Department of Industrial Relations to um, really implement some of the recent worker protection legislation and also to support um, an interdisciplinary outreach campaign on reaching every Californian. Um, so that's a very quick run through. Happy to answer questions or um, Tim, turn to you for greater detail on those projects that will be going through the state board. Uh, great, thanks, Abby. I'll, I'll quickly um, just dive a little tiny bit deeper great. into the five items that are proposed uh, for the state workforce board. All of all of the items coming to to this state board um, build on the high road work um, that you all know a, a lot about, with the slight exception of the language justice pathway that Abby um, walked through very eloquently. Um, so I, I, I won't go through that one again. It's a beautiful program. Um, if you want to know more about it, we can talk. Um, but the premise of high road, as you well know, is that we can't achieve equity if we don't pay attention to job quality. So engaging industry first um, as a workforce approach is the way we get at this. Um, that's the DNA of the high road, the deep industry engagement, build partnerships with employers and, and organized labor, then align workforce programs that serve populations with barriers directly um, so that we're connecting people who most need jobs to good quality jobs. Um, the end game is to increase economic equity by transforming the way that whole sectors recruit, hire, retain talent. Um, our aim is to build at least one high road training partnership, high road construction careers initiative program 
in each major sec sector and every corner of, of California. So we end up with a California economy defined by quality jobs and equity and, and climate resilience. Very long game stuff. Uh, so the healthcare high road that Abby uh, started off with, State Workforce Board uh, is $340 million over three years. Industry-based work, very much in the high road training partnership fashion. Uh, as Abby said, targeting those, uh, those occupations that don't require four-year degrees, largely in the allied health occupations. Bob knows a ton about this. Uh, so does Jim, so do many people on the phone uh, or on the Zoom. Um, so it's everything but doctors and nurses, I think, essentially, right? Medical assistants, respiratory technicians, surgical techs, um, psychiatric techs, um, uh, and, and so on. Um, the data that we looked at uh, that was pulled together by labor agency working with LMID uh, over at the Employment Development Department shows that uh, between 2018 and 2028, uh, there are 2 million allied health openings in California extraordinary number. So we're going to get at it, but we're not going to solve the problem. This is a much bigger uh, effort challenge. Um, they're just there for a medical assistance alone. There are 150,000 openings in California over that period of time uh, to 2028. Um, that's the healthcare piece. Uh, the language justice pathway, California youth leadership program. I just want to say it, it's, it's such an interesting, amazing program. It's building on what uh, the labor agency has already invested in. It, it's a twofer. Um, we need more advocates in legal and language services for immigrants, um, but this is also creating a great pathway to careers for young people who have a real passion for that work. Um, so really excited about the potential of that and, and hope that it uh, makes its way through. Uh, the the well-capping uh, workforce pilot, $15 million one-time funds, a very unique initiative also building on the high road uh, agenda. Uh, we're actually working with the Department of Conservation uh, because uh, there's a proposal in the budget also to invest $200 million uh, to plug over two years to plug orphan oil and gas wells. And that's gonna drive demand uh, for, for workers in that subsector. And what we're gonna do is uh, build pathways to those jobs or help workers who are already in oil and gas transition over to that work. Oil capping work requires skills that are common. Uh, as many of you know, in several of the construction trades, Jeremy knows this obviously, very well. Um, and it's, just, it's especially aligned with oil and gas drilling. So our intention is to help transition current workers, um, but also create opportunities for dislocated workers uh, to go to work in, in oil well capping, um, building on uh, building new skills training into existing DAS state approved apprenticeship programs uh, that uh, serve Kern County. That's, that's the focus of this. Um, the next one, very quickly, the low carbon uh, economy program that's, as Abby said, that's picking up uh, uh, investing more dollars in expanding high road training partnerships and high road construction careers, $60 million over three years. And then finally, the goods movement workforce training campus, $110 million over three years. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to hand that over to Veen really quickly. Avine, if you could uh, touch on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Avin Sharma, um, in addition to being uh, one of your fellow board members, I'm also the director of labor and workforce development for the Port of Los Angeles. So I'll just uh, take a couple of minutes to uh, expand on what the project is. So, you know, I, I joined the port about four and a half years ago. And in addition it, for it being a new role for me, it was also a new role for the port. Uh, the Port of LA was looking at what role uh, we can have in developing uh, the work in promoting workforce development within the goods movement industry. Uh, the go goods movement industry is not known for workforce development. And frankly, uh, with some of the great research done by the UC Berkeley Labor Center, it's pointed out it's going in the wrong direction. So we at the port have been looking at how do we create, how do we create that change and how do we create that culture change? And about four years ago, uh, the port, as many of you know, was one of the state's first high road training partnerships. And as a state, and the most important as one of the most important aspects of that partnership that we developed here, and, and you know, I'd said this over and over to Tim and uh, you know, former Secretary Sue at the time was, sure, we have a pilot initiative that we're working a pilot training program that's part of our HRTP grant, but the bigger task and the bigger goal is to create culture change at the port and start to create culture change in the industry to think about workforce development. And we had a successful pilot program through our HRTP project, and now we're taking it to the next level. And, um, and in 
in, it, in NACHA. And you know, now that we've introduced the high road principles at the port, we're now looking to inject it into the entire goods movement industry. And we want to accomplish that by this campus. Um, and I, I use the word campus intentionally in that the, the ports identified 15 acres of property at the port. Uh, and it's going to be a campus in the same way a college campus trains for different uh, disciplines. This campus will provide a training for longshore, trucking, and warehousing, uh, at least. So those are the, the first three dis, uh, subject areas uh, we're, we're focused on. And, you know, I'll just quickly say the two big pillars uh, that are holding this up are safety and also sustainability. You know, on the safety side, uh, you know, for example, longshore, uh, Southern California is the largest concentration of longshore workers in the country. Uh, they do not have a dedicated training campus. They use three or four sites scattered around the Wilmington and Long Beach communities. And then they also use uh, live terminals for training. And, um, you know, unfortunately just in 2022 and starting off there, we've already had three fatalities on our terminals. And so there's, it's a reminder, it, we, you know, we're constantly reminded of how dangerous a setting a live terminal is. And to have longshore train on live terminals, uh, they've done it, but that's, that's not the best, of the best outcome. And so, you know, the famous ship to shore cranes that you all see, uh, longshore crane operators, uh, as part of their training, need to train on those live cranes. And in normal times, you just find a quiet day at one of the terminals and you can train on it. Well, there are no quiet days at the ports anymore. And so, uh, you know, we, part of the reason why there aren't quiet days at the ports anymore is because there's so much cargo coming in and you need the crane operators to take the cargo off. Uh, we can't train enough crane operators because there aren't enough cranes to train them on. So you've got this bottleneck in place that's really challenging. And so, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, safety in terms of providing a safe environment uh, for training and then also um, as well on the uh, looking at uh, trucking and warehousing and, you know, on the trucking and warehousing side, talking to um, important stakeholders to us, like, the, like the Teamsters and other organizations on how do you, how do we provide, how do we remove some of the barriers to entry on this, uh, in this area and provide low cost or no cost training? Um, you know, as, as some of you, many of you know, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration just came out with some new regulations just a couple of weeks ago on uh, standards that are applied for truck driver training. But we want to take that a step further and how, how use this public asset here uh, to provide training and to have the space for training. And then also, you know, on the warehousing side as well, thinking about many of the equipment that's used on terminals at the port are also the same equipment used in warehousing and in rail uh, facilities elsewhere. So again, how do we how do we uplift this industry to think about training? And then, you know, we we would also take our existing HRTP project, and we just started this year launching a reskilling and upskilling project for uh, workers at the port. We'll take those existing projects and put them onto the campus as well. And then, you know, the last piece on the sustainability side of this is. Uh, the ports have committed that by 2030, all the cargo handling equipment you see as you come past the port or drive over the bridges of the port will be zero emission. And it's important to us as we are trying to promote that technology and get that technology developed is we're hearing from manufacturers and others that, well, you also need a workforce that's trained to handle this technology. And so as we work with the Daimlers and the uh, uh, Volvos of the of the world to develop the truck technology and the tailors to develop the cargo handling equipment. We also want to make sure that we've got an environment there on on training and and, and uh, as well. And so to make sure that our workers uh, are trained on zero emission technology and how to operate it. And uh, you know, frankly, sometimes employers say, "Well, they can't afford the training, or they don't have a trained workforce." We want to take that excuse away. And so by, as we're designing and developing this campus, we're making sure it's got the right um, you know, electric infrastructure in place so that once the zero emission cargo handling equipment does come online and it, it is more prevalent throughout the port communities and the goods movement industry, that it could be trained um, and also piloted and tested uh, here on this campus. So those are uh, two of the main pillars, uh, safety and then also with an eye towards sustainability. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Avin. I Just to add something that's uh, related but different, um, not part of the budget, but AB 639 created uh, an industry panel at, at the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, to study automation uh, at the port complex uh, and the impacts on workers in the surrounding communities. So we've been putting together the industry panel. Uh, it, it is set to meet very soon, uh, possibly um, 
well, very soon, I won't say when, um, because we still have a couple of gaps in the industry panel that we're trying to fill. Um, UCLA is, is facilitating this process. We'll be doing a report um, providing recommendations to the legislature on, uh, on ways to mitigate the employment impacts of automation and the transition to low zero emission operations at the port. Um, so that, that report will be due to the legislature uh, in July, 2023. Uh, so I, just wanted to, I, yeah. I actually forgot the, the most important part of what I wanted to share was actually a picture. Picture's <laughs> more powerful than me just yabbing on. Um, so let me share a screen just real quick to show you, to show everyone. Um, so if you could see this, this is, this is what the campus will look like upon completion. Uh, it would have, as I talked about some of the ship to shore cranes, the training, uh, the training environment for mechanic and repair work uh, set, set on uh, this campus that would have uh, different areas and different spaces to train on technology. So I just thought I'd share that to give everyone a perspective of what this will look like. Thank you. Thanks, Yvine. Uh, Mr. Cherry, sorry for taking so long. We just came off a uh, uh, budget hearings yesterday, so we're, we're still working with that momentum. No, this is very exciting, very promising information. I appreciate uh, Abby, Tim, Yvine, all of you guys for sharing this great information. And uh, Bruce had also asked, and I'm sure many others, if, if this information, the, the presentation specifically can be shared to the, to the full board. Yeah, Abby, is that okay if we share the- Of course, the yeah, yeah. Slides, great. Of course. Thank you. Our first comment or question is from Gloria. Thanks. Um, I it was uh, while you were showing the presentation, Abby, when you had the screen up for immigrant uh, workforce, the question that I had was, um, I think it was the third um, section where it talked about, it, and it was dealing with community colleges, and it talked about um, immigrants and um, youth of color. And I was wondering whether that was possible to be in the previous, since I don't see the slide in front of me, the previous um, statement as well, because I think it's um, important um, in the workforce. And I think that's what he was sharing was about the workforce and the fact of needing adequate training when people are on the job. And I think that applies to people of color as well. So I just wanted to find out whether that could be included in that previous statement. So I think you're referring to the workplace literacy um, investment that would be 20 million for the employment training panel. That yeah. one is targeted to English language learners, many of whom of course are people of color. Um, I think what is most promising in my view would be the um, um, 60 million um, that would be going, 90 million, I'm sorry, going to ETP for healthcare, um, just given the um, you know, concentration of workers of color, particularly women of color in low paying healthcare jobs. I think that particular investment has promise for um, you know, building people's skills for career advancement within healthcare. Um, I appreciate that. I just would hope that it would be spelled out as well. And thank you for the excellent presentation. Oh, thank you, Gloria. Yeah. Thank you, Gloria. Bob? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, you know, I could have brought uh, some sharing of our PowerPoint and maybe shown uh, at our port that Evan was talking about from LA at our port in Oakland, we could show a new baseball stadium. <laughs> that they have decided to build at the port, uh, which is pretty, which is kind of interesting because there was a lot of discussion about the emissions from the trucks and how that impacts the baseball and everything else down there and how it's such an important issue um, to reduce the emissions from the trucks at the ports and how most of the folks at the port are really in favor of that. Um, so anyway, it was kind of interesting. But the comment that I actually wanted to talk about was just to say thank you to Abby again. As I, as I said at the executive board meeting, um, uh, you know, they, uh, we're so excited about the proposed money for healthcare. I mean, overall, 1.7 billion. And there's so much opportunity for us. Uh, and particularly in the last few weeks, you know, we've been working on these EMT programs and particularly the paramedic program. And we found out in the state that really the paramedic program is really tied closely with the EMT program and even under the same classifications. And they're very, very different. 
a paramedic is like the difference between a registered nurse and a vocationary vocation nurse. And in, the, in in this time when you know, as I talk about how the delivery of healthcare continues to change, the role of paramedics is huge right now, and it's a huge opportunity. Obviously, because entry level is not you know four year degree is not required for a paramedic. So um, you know, I just want to uh, you know, as you talk about the proposal. Uh, in terms with the state for the for the 60 million, I, I think it's really important to point out the role of the paramedic. Uh, you know, Tim, we've already talked about the you you know partnering with the High Roads Partnership in terms of those programs. I mean, traditionally the paramedics were used basically by firefighters, ambulances, but now that uh, you know, I had a meeting with our consortium in the Bay Area, and I found out even our major healthcare employers and providers are using paramedics. So there's a lot of opportunity that I didn't even know about that I now know about. So I just want to make sure that we draw that distinction in that funding for the EMT and we make sure that there's funding uh, not only for EMTs and paramedics are required to be EMTs to move on, but we have now a career pathway from EMT to paramedics. And the amount of money and security and resources that a paramedic can make is double and triple the amount of an EMT. So that opportunity for us, particularly with high roads, Tim, is really great. So just want to thank you. I'll do whatever I can to help you with that. And I just wanted to call it out. Thank you. Just a quick response. Um, you know, I think part of what your comment makes me think about, Bob, is the importance of framing this initiative as a, a one large initiative that is greater than the sum of its parts. And certainly part of the vision that we have in developing it, um, and I, I want some graphic capability to really be able to map this out, is to show kind of mobility among and between different programs. Um, so I appreciate your calling out paramedics. We also have learned a little bit that, um, you know, in Alameda County, EMTs are being used in, um, in different ways as well, um, in homeless shelters and homeless services. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and those are just great entry points into healthcare, especially for, for young people. Thank you both. And as Annette also mentions, uh, registered nurses uh, can begin their pathways at, uh, at community college level also. So thank you all for that, that those great updates. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, it just made me, and forgive me for not being on camera, it just made me think colleges right now are doing their environmental scans and just making sure that the economists and folks that um, help them with their studies have access to this information. Because, you know, you kind of just look at how curriculum evolves and sometimes, you know, we're behind the time with, you know, some of the changes that are happening. And so if there's a way to just you know, make sure that, you know, because what Bob just said, it was just like a workshop by itself right there. <laughs> and so just making sure uh, if there's ways to get that information to share broadly, um, you know, I don't know how to get it out to the faculty senates um, because they're the ones that are making curricular decisions just to make sure that, you know, we are uh, making sure that these medical programs are, are meeting the, uh, the needs in the, in the local areas. And that was just the thought that came to my mind as I listened to you all speak. Thank you, Joseph. Anybody else want to add anything before we move on? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next update and discussion is our staffing update for our, agent, for our Workforce Development Board. And Curtis, are, are you available to, to share that? Yeah, good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, good morning. Curtis with the Workforce Development Board. Uh, I'll keep this pretty quick. Um, uh, we updated the board last time that the Workforce Development Board had added 20 new positions and uh, as part of last year's budget and with the growing um, budget uh, investments for our programs, uh, we are just trying to keep up with our staffing. Uh, just a couple of quick notes um, for some folks. We did have some uh, departures um, from some of our senior managers, um, Cindy Harrington and Emily Sunahara. Um, but we've also uh, been able to fill some of those positions, uh, and they're both internal candidates with Chan Se Chow, uh, who's our new SSM2 uh, manager, senior manager in program, and Jamie Glenn, uh, who also stepped up as one of our managers uh, in our grant management team. 
Uh, we'll also wanted to welcome uh, Anna Champy, our new uh, communications manager at the CWDB. Uh, as you all know, there's a, there's a ton of work in and lifting it up and, and telling the story uh, is not not always uh, easy. So it's it's great to have some um, dedicated capacity. Also wanted to welcome um, Evelyn Kuzmenko, our new IT associate, uh, and Kay Chin and Marissa um, Medeiros, who are both in our finance and business services team. Um, lots of uh, lots of finance, lots of contracts uh, in in business services. A lot of uh, stuff to process. So um, the new capacity is welcome, uh, and and wanted to also welcome our uh, our new managers to the team. We will continue uh, staffing up and filling vacancies. We still have a a number of vacancies that our managers are actively working to fill, um, especially given all this new workload. And um, we'll continue uh, to do our planning um, also within the executive and, and management team. Um, looking at uh, implementation of the new programs uh, that were just described in the in the budget updates. So um, everything's uh, running pretty pretty smoothly, I guess, as it were. Uh, just but wanted to provide a couple of updates uh, on staffing. Thank you, Curtis. We uh, welcome all of our new staff members and are always grateful for the dedication of everybody uh, that's part of the workforce development staff team. Thank you so much. Our uh, next uh, update is youth policy, Pradeep. Good morning, everyone, uh, Chair Farooq, members of the board. Uh, I'll give a brief update of what we've been doing in the last several months uh, at the behest of uh, Member Williams, looking at initially looking at uh, a scan of uh, uh, youth uh, policy and activity across uh, our, our, our system. And we did, did that in three ways. We conducted a survey of local workforce boards. Uh, we reviewed the local plans and uh, we did uh, uh, initial research uh, 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 looking at some documents that were previously produced as well as, as a, a, a new ones from the Department of Labor. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, uh, this year, there, uh, the, the, this program year, uh, uh, the WIO, which requires 75% of youth expenditures on out-of-school youth, uh, uh, has been reduced to 50%, uh, uh, giving more opportunity for strategic planning for youth outside of WIO uh, and, and, uh, and the required elements laid out in, in, the, uh, uh, in WSD 2005. <clears throat> when we reviewed uh, the, the, the plans, it, it, all, all of the local workforce boards met the 14 required elements, but some of them went over and beyond. The more proactive local areas are the ones who created a partnership with local education agencies and have a variety of youth work ex experiences available, pre-apprenticeship and unpaid apprenticeships. We also uh, uh, looked at, uh, also did the survey and, and it confirmed that, be, that all of them are meeting uh, the 14 required elements, but some of them were uh, uh, engaging with business and other partners more proactively and, and uh, were going above and beyond those 14 elements. The, uh, the, so the initial product that we are putting together is a policy brief that uh, looks at how we can create a taxonomy for how uh, youth services are being approached. Initially, we looked at low, medium, high, but I'm not sure that's appropriate. And so we used a, a uh, or we're thinking of using a, um, uh, a document that was produced by the Department of Labor called the Recipe of Success, uh, where they looked at several uh, categories. One is a shared vision, uh, data and information for decision-making, creating a strategic plan, community resource mapping and addressing the gaps, 
staff support and oversight and accountability. So we, we will be including this in the, in the policy brief that uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are going to complete soon and then essentially uh, look for direction for, for next steps. Thank you, uh, Pradeep, uh, for your uh, update on, on the policy, uh, youth policy component. Are there any questions or comments from the board on any of our updates? And was there any public comments submitted for these updates? No public comment. Thank you. We'll now shift to our initiative updates. I'll do a quick round of, of, of updates, starting with uh, uh, Pradeep for policy legislation and research. I'm just trying to get to my, my report here. Just, uh, I have uh, several to open today. Uh, I, I'll break this down into, in, into uh, at least in, in the, in the uh, policy recent legislation br branch, it's divided in four different areas. One is data management administration. And the second one is state partnerships. The third one is policy and legislation, and, and the fourth one is research. So let me start with data management and administration. Uh, we have just, we're reaching the finishing line with, of, uh, with two major reports uh, using the CalSkills uh, program. Uh, just to, uh, as a reminder, the CalSkills uh, program is is collecting data, workforce uh, level data across uh, eleven different programs from seven different agencies, uh, and 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 two reports were produced. One is a wo workforce dashboard metrics report that is going through its final stages of uh, of uh, accessibility, and 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 we will be placing that on the website. Uh, within the next couple of weeks. The, the second report, and I think this was uh, part of a special presentation to the board uh, a few weeks back, is the, uh, the uh, California Policy Lab impact analysis, where they presented uh, uh, results uh, from, from, from these uh, same programs. And that report, that report is right now at agency and is uh, waiting for, for uh, approval and, and uh, within, the next, uh, uh, within the next month, we will have that also on the website. And uh, so those two reports, uh, we are moving for, forward. Ho next time we meet at the board and uh, we, will, we will then, uh, we'll, uh, we, will, we hope that all of that will be publicly available uh, uh, to, uh, for, for everyone to review. Uh, besides finishing up these reports, the CalSkills team is, create, is working in, in, three, in, in three different uh, areas. One is essentially moving the whole CalSkills database infrastructure from a 20th century technology to a 21st century technology, which is essentially the cloud-based system that would have uh, that would have multiple uses, both in terms of uh, accessing that information for uh, uh, for research and presenting that information in, in, in an easy way uh, for the public. The team is also working with the different partners to update uh, the partnership agreements. We've learned a lot about the data that was provided to us from these different partners and, and what, uh, what, what additional data would be needed and, and, and having conversations with our partners on that. And, and the third piece that we're looking at is essentially trying to look at a uniform structure in terms of which this data would be inputted into this, into this, uh, 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 into the CalSkill system. The reason, uh, not only is the reason that would help us work across all of our programs with, uh, within the agency, but also, also our different partners. But as you know, uh, uh, there has been 
uh, and, uh, and the, uh, that's, uh, the new the, is the cradle to career program that has started and CalSkills is being viewed as, as the, 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 the primary source of workforce development uh, information. And so we're, we're trying to, to work in, in tandem, although that's the, the relationship between Cradle to Career and, and, and uh, CalSkills is still very, very basic and incipient right now. The second area that the team works in state partnership teams, uh, quickly going through that, we've been talking to many of our partner agencies for one in terms of updating our, our, our WIO partnerships, but we're also looking at expanding strategic partnerships with different agencies. Uh, clearly one of the interests would be in trying to look at, at in the healthcare area and in, in social services. We are also, and, and as, as you've heard many times before, we have a fairly established uh, relationship in the climate area. And a lot of work is going on uh, uh, with regard to in the climate area. And this is, so not only do we talk with our partners, we also are doing research in, in, in uh, uh, standards and staff is working on that uh, in terms of lo looking at the uh, uh, and and thir and all uh, thirdly we are also uh, uh, engaging in conversations with other agency making presentations to them wh when appropriate. Another area we work in is in the regional co coordination efforts. Uh, uh, we are in. Uh, we were in conversation with with Gobes with regard to the Good Jobs Challenge, and there were uh, 19 applicants from uh, all over the state that applied for the Good Jobs Challenge, and there was coordination between uh, Gobes and and uh, our office to make sure that the letter approval that was sent with those applications included. Uh, 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 included uh, a support for the HIRO training partnerships. Uh, in the area of policy and legislation, uh, the state plan modification public comment period is over and staff is working through that to update that information. And we are starting to begin local, local and regional plan modification directives. Uh, uh, the policy unit working with EDD did a national DOL technical assistance webinar on WIOA mem memorandums of understanding. The uh, in the legislative area, uh, bill introduction deadline was uh, last week, February 18th, and, and new, and we are gearing up to receive uh, uh, an increase in workload with regard to uh, legislative activity. Finally, in the area of research, there's several projects besides the, the CalSkills work, there's several projects that are doing third party evaluations, uh, AB 1111, our, our regional RPI, uh, the Regional Planning Initiative and AJCC. There are, uh, there, all of them are near completion and we hope to have the reports finished by the end of the fiscal year. P2E, we are in, in working with the University of California Riverside uh, to work on a third party evaluation. And uh, uh, we're working uh, uh, with, with, the, with the Riverside to, uh, to lay out the research methodologies. We've been having discussions with CDCR to, to uh, get uh, information on, on uh, 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 the, the, popul that the population uh, and, and working with them to expand uh, that relationship with CDCR uh, on the present employment population. Finally, we are building a data dictionary for all our state programs and using that information for developing Salesforce data platform. So with that, I'll, uh, that's the end of my report. And uh, 
if there are any questions. Thank you, Pradeep, for that update. Uh, we'll move to our program implementation uh, team uh, update from Joelle, and we'll take questions um, at the end after all the updates. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on our Workforce Accelerator Program 8.0, which again was focused on homeless and housing um, insecure population, closes in March. So we'll be adding that to um, our evaluation schedule. 9.0 is the current cohort um, that we are working with. They had a well-attended community of practice uh, earlier this month that included sessions on workforce analysis with discussions around building employer partnerships in a post-COVID-19 labor market, racial equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies, and a presentation um, of the Equitable Apprenticeship Toolkit and all the sessions are recorded and will be shared on the CWDB webpage within the next few weeks. Um, Accelerator 10.0 was submitted, read, and scored on the Salesforce platform, so that was a huge accomplishment. Um, and recommendations will, for awards will be going to the secretary early next week. Um, and then again, as Curtis mentioned, um, Chan Se Chao, who has been a program manager, was uh, earned a promotion with us and is now a branch manager. So she is overseeing now Accelerator in, and Breaking Barriers and some of the HRTPs. So those of you interested in the Accelerator Initiative, Chan is now overseeing that program. For the Regional Equity um, Recovery Program, that application went live last Tuesday and was followed by a very well attended workshop. Um, and those applications are due April 22nd. Uh, for the WIOA HRTP 21-22 state fiscal year um, funds, those are to supplement current HRTPs to build on strategies through industry-specific innovation leading to improvements in equity, job quality, and environmental sustainability. Um, those projects will improve, expand, and or scale um, long-term goals, and, and Aida may touch on this on her, on her um, report out. But we've, uh, we have sent up recommendations for 18 project awards and one technical assistance award um, to the labor agency, totaling 10, a little over 10.5 million. For the HRTP general fund 21-22 budget, um, uh, we are calling this the High Road Training Partnership Resilient Workforce Fund Program. The application has been developed on the Salesforce platform and staff are currently working with developers on a pre-application screening tool. The pre-applications uh, screening tool will be like a triage tool to understand what stage a partnership is in, whether it's planning and arranging, uh, emerging or thriving and growing. Um, it will also help us to identify which funding source best suits this partnership um, or how the field team can help engage with the partnership. Um, so the pre-application is where uh, the, the scoring will happen and then those applicants will be invited to apply. This is a rolling fund, so there won't be any um, like cutoff dates for the pre-applications, but we will process contracts on a quarterly schedule just to keep our sanity. Um, any new dollars that are dedicated to HRTP and future budget, budgets will be able to be added to this fund um, so that we can get money out as quickly as possible. On the breaking barriers, AD 1111, that one also closes in March, and the 2122 funds are scheduled to release to be released in June. Prison to employment, we have um, a summit that is scheduled for March 1st, and um, when I get a chance, I'll put a link to the RSVP or Miranda if you can um, in the chat. This program also ends in March and the 2122 funds are scheduled to be released um, in May or June. For high road construction careers, we had, um, we had an allocation in the 2122 budget and some um, leftover uh, SB1 funds. So we were gonna be developing a similar rolling fund like we are doing for HRTP, we'll be doing that for HRCC and hope to have that on the Salesforce platform late spring. And that is it for my report. Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, and our last initiative update is for, on our high road field team, Aida Cardenas. Hi, good morning, good late morning, everyone. Um, so I'll just share some highlights 
uh, just from the last uh, from the last three months from the last um, board meeting. So in the hybrid construction careers, we were able to um, our, our leaders there had uh, the first um, community of practice convening with the different um, regions throughout the state that came together to share best practices. Our regional partnerships around hybrid construction careers are all at different levels of, of, uh, of where they are in their program and then their design and implementation in terms of scale, but also sort of history or experience. And so bringing them together to share best practices um, is already proving to be a great benefit to, um, to our project. So that happened in December um, and just want to Give a shout out to a board member, Jeremy Smith, who's helping and assisting and leading a lot of that work. Um, and it's a great, uh, great support for our hybrid construction careers as that work continues to expand. Uh, the Lumina Foundation has also is also investing in three HRCCs uh, to focus on working with community colleges and breaking barriers to access to um, the mechanical careers and look, uh, prioritizing and looking at vocational ESL and vocational math. Uh, so these are in the areas of the Central Valley, the Inland Empire, and the San, Di San Diego and Imperial Valley. So we're really expanding our our, our partners and stakeholders um, and really creating public and private partnerships um, to support our communities into these careers. So those are some of the highlights in this last um, quarter. Um, and as um, uh, as Joelle mentioned, we've been, the field team's been working on since the passing of the last budget really hard to look for potential new high road training partnerships, but also providing technical assistant gui um, guidance uh, around the model, around the framework, working with projects around you know how to incorporate worker voice um how you know how how is equity being addressed in their projects who are the industry leaders at the table and also pointing them to other projects that may have some similar components that they might be looking at like mentorship or, or other areas so we've been working with uh, dozens of potential new projects and as joel mentioned with opening up the new um, fund making sure that we you know we are sort of steps ahead in the field um, so that we can support folks and, and potential partnerships uh, to be successful in an application, but also to be successful in the implementation of the work, knowing that this is, you know, like Mr. Avin Sharma was sharing, this is systems change, this is this is industry interventions, this is really looking at how uh, workforce development is integrated um, as a strategy and not just a training, but really looking at um, industry leaders, uh, looking at workforce strategies as a means uh, uh, to address equity and job quality, as well as, you know, climate uh, climate impacts. Uh, so we've been working really hard on that, getting folks ready. So we're, we're excited for the new um, opportunities to apply. We've been working very closely with Joelle's team, who've been great, and the Salesforce team to, 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 um, to set up a more streamlined process and make the, the funds also more, uh, more accessible. So very excited about that. And with our existing projects, we continue our communities of practice. Uh, we do monthly, um, you know, quarterly webinars of information, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, and monthly peer-to-peer -peer learning. A lot of projects are coming together um, and learning from one, one another and also working at the regional level together. And um, I wanted to, I have a little slideshow, uh, but before I go into the slideshow, um, we also in December had the opening of the, um, of a training center for uh, the uh, our tree trimming project. And so this was a new training center in Woodland uh, with IBW, NECA, and just a joint labor management partnership. So it was great to see the launch of that. We're gonna see hundreds and, and, and thousands of workers uh, trained there in the coming year. So very excited um, that we have that training center up and, up and running. So that was an exciting uh, visit. And in December, we also, um, did a visit to the Inland Empire. We um, invited the new Labor Secretary, um, uh, Secretary um, Palugiai, to um, to visit some of the projects in the Inland Empire, and then did a follow up visit the following day to the ports. And so I really just want to also give a shout out to uh, board members, uh, Dr. Farouk, Mr. Uh, Jamil Dada, uh, Senator Connie Leva, Mr. Joseph um, Williams, and uh, Mr. Avin Sharma, who all, were all in either many of these visits or some of these visits. Um, so I'm gonna share a slideshow while I finish my report. That way you're, um, you have something to see. And then at the beginning, I'm just gonna give it time to do, 
um, the secretary gives a very brief, some brief words. So I'm going to, is that, is that sharing? We'll see some brief. Uh, the reason that I'm here with you today, of course, is to learn. I came here to see and to learn about the program, to learn from all of you who have participated, uh, and to think about, you know, what is working well in our programs and these kind of new innovative high road training programs, where we can make improvements, where we can continue to make investments, and how we can replicate these models across the state and across different industries. So as you shared, that was the purpose of the visits, and you'll just see a slideshow while I finish my uh, report around the Inland Empire visits. Um, we first visit out to our Inland and um, IELI, the Inland Empire Labor Institute. So it's a new nonprofit connected to um, the uh, Central Labor Council there in the area partnership with um, the Teamsters 1932, as well as the People's Collect um, Collective for Environmental Justice, the Warehouse Workers Resource Center, the Riverside Community Colleges, uh, San Bernardino Community Colleges, also, um, also present there, um, you see workers and also employers um, in the trades and logistics. And so this was a conversation uh, around bringing the partners together of a new training center that's opening up there. And um, it was it was great to see the, the commitment from leaders in the area to look looking at trades and logistics. And again, there's a construction of some of the new um, uh, uh, training space that, that we'll see there. In that convening, we also um, had the um, high road construction careers in the Inland Empire um, to share, you know, partnership with, again, with the community colleges and the local workforce system there, as well as the Building Trades Council. Um, so it was a great way to, you know, see how far the partnership has come in the last year since it's funded. We then headed over to the West Water Valley District and um, and visited the power plant and where this is where the training happens for some of the workers. And this conversation started a couple of years ago with one, one leader there from the Westwater uh, Valley District who said, you know, we need to create opportunities for community members to access uh, these good jobs and really looked at the model of our HRTP in the Bay Area under JVS with Bay Works and made those connections and were able to, um, to replicate that model um, to show that um, it, it's not just bringing together the one water uh, one water district, but we've now um, built into the partnerships over seven different water agencies in the region that um, that are coming together, build a curriculum that makes sense for all of those. That way, they can all hire from one um, from one training program and from one partnership. So it's really ex it shows how we can scale faster and go further faster uh, by using the models and in, in what we've um, what we've learned from um, in those areas. So you see everybody there um, and you know speaking to workers who are connected to community-based organizations, again partnering there with um, the IE Black Worker Center, other community-based groups as, as well as the local workforce system to ensure and provide supportive services to the participants. Um, but this is really about creating a different a different way in which workers in the community can engage with this industry and access these jobs. Uh, so we're learning a lot uh, from that project and for that region, but um, but have a lot of support and, and momentum in the area. Very excited to see where that where that will go um, in the in the coming years. And um, we also were invited to uh, a meet and greet of the labor secretary with the. Um, with the um, Inland Empire uh, Central Labor Council. And it was just a reassuring a commitment to ensure that there's job quality, that we we keep an eye to equity and job quality as we look at, um, at investing in high road training partnerships. And then headed the next day to the Port of LA, there is definitely a connection between uh, trades and logistics in the Inland Empire and in the ports. And as, as you heard in the reports earlier, really also uh, looking at uh, how we continue to build on the um, the HRTP work done at the ports and, and where it needs to go and, and looking at the, the training center also included a conversation with um, 
with the LA County Central Labor Council there, as well as the UCLA Labor Center that's um, uh, spearheading, the, spearheading the research around um, AB 639 and the panel that um, uh, Tim uh, referred to earlier. So I think that's what I've got for that. So there's just, I just wanted you to see the, everyone in action and we were able to again to take a, 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 a tour and the Secretary Pelugia was able to meet with various industry leaders as again, do continuous learning and how we can uh, use um, workforce development as a means to address equity climate and jobs um, at the ports. Um, stop sharing now. Um, I was trying to time my report with the slides, so bear with me. I'm trying to be creative so y'all don't get too bored with videos and stuff, but, um, but just wanted to see, I just wanted you to see how many people are behind these partnerships. And many times, you know, it's not, it, you know, and I say this almost every time, right? It's like, we want to see the outcome. How many workers can we impact? But we're able to impact and scale when we are able to build the right infrastructure, right? And the high road model is really about starting with the industry leaders, partnership as a priority, worker voice, right? And so those are the key components and pieces. And many of you have been a part of seeing some of these partnerships evolve in one way or, in, or another. And it does take you know, a year to two years just to get it all established and all, you know, have the right, you want to have the right decision makers in the room, but you also want them to engage in the process and have ownership. So there's compliance, so that there's uh, accountability, so that there's a commitment uh, to the workers, there's a commitment to the jobs, and there's a commitment, you know, from the workers to the industry, right? And so, uh, so these are just some highlights from some of our field work. We were able to get out um, in December, um, had to put a pause on it again in January. I mean, we're doing our field work virtually, but hopefully that just provides um, some context and insight. And, you know, we hope to, to be able to get out into the field and visit these training centers and continue to support these partners coming together. Um, once they come together, it doesn't mean it's all said and done. We have to do continuous work to maintain those partnerships. Many of you involved in partnership work know that they're very dynamic. Um, and so if we want to really take things to the next level, when we see a lot of these new resources coming in from the state and the budget, it's our opportunity now to take advantage. We don't know where this is going to be in terms of opportunities for resources in two, three, four, or five years. So right now is a time to make our big moves in terms of industry change. And so just want to thank all of you that have been part of uh, doing the partnership building work um, and, and just, you know, excited to see, you know, some of these results. Um, but still a lot of work, um, a lot of work ahead of us in looking at different industries, but just wanted to highlight a few for you all. And, and if I could just add to, uh, thanks Chairman Farouk, um, add to uh, what I, I had laid out um, beautifully. Um, we do a lot of work at the State Workforce Board connecting policy and practice. Um, so what Pradeep mentioned that there's, a, there's kind of a Sacramento uh, game, I like to call it. Um, especially around climate and with climate agencies and departments um, where we're uh, providing advice to those departments and agencies around workforce standards uh, in, in, the, in the funding that goes out, contracts and procurement. Uh, and that in turn uh, creates the conditions for building high rate training partnerships on the ground uh, in different regions of the state. Um, so we, we've, you know, been doing a lot of work supporting Secretary Pelugi uh, and, and the labor agency around offshore wind, um, oil well capping, as I, as I mentioned, the program work that we're gonna be doing around that, Lithium Valley uh, as well. So that's, that's an important part of this work is making sure that what we do as a state is, is helping to kind of queue up our ability to create high rate training partnerships on the ground and then access to those, those good jobs that are created for people who most need good jobs. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm bringing this up not because I wanna to pander to Assemblyman Salas and Senator Leva who are on the, who are on the Zoom, uh, or maybe I am, um, but there it is. Uh, back to you, Chairman Fruit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tim, and thank you, Aida. Thank you, all the, all, uh, all the great updates. This is really dynamic, and it's, it's, again, gives the depth of really the great work that the agency and the board and everyone's doing, so thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments for any of, of our um, updates? Okay, were there any public comments submitted regarding these updates?
Ms. Clemente or anyone else available to respond about the public comments status? No public comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now move to our local board update. Uh, this is the standing item on our agenda uh, for our local workforce development boards. We have 45 in total for the state to be able to report. It gives us uh, as a board, state board an opportunity to have our pulse on what's happening locally regarding economic recovery, qual job quality, and equity. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Priscilla Lopez, director of the Imperial County Workforce Development Board. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me today. Uh, so so I I'm, imagine you guys have heard there's a lot of very exciting things going down in Imperial County. Um, we are really, really working hard towards the development of, of the minerals extractions, specifically lithium extraction industry here locally. That can be a game changer for Imperial County, as you all know, we struggle quite a bit um, year after year with very high double digit unemployment um, numbers. As a matter of fact, uh, in December, we were at 14.7, which is the lowest we've been in a couple of years. And at the height of the pandemic, we were at 28.1, if I'm not mistaken. So it, it's painful. And, and having uh, an industry that's coming in and, and can completely change the um, economic uh, uh, sustainability of our of our community is absolutely wonderful. So we're really excited and we've been working hard to help um, get this done and get it done correctly. Um, so we've gathered our industry professionals and, and our industry, um, uh, the companies that are coming in are, and, and they, they've really helped, they've been very engaged with both education, vocational trainers, um, junior college, IVC has been extremely involved, San Diego State, which is the only four-year um, traditional university locally. We have, they have the, the off-campus here and a larger campus um, potentially in, in Brawley. Um, and we've been looking at, at putting together a career pathway even and the Office of Ed as well. So we're, we're trying to cr create opportunity for not only our youth, but the people that are, that are already unemployed or potentially looking for a different career um, to be ready and developed when these industry professionals are ready to kick off and open their doors. So it's been interesting to watch um, the, the discussion because we're trying to focus on the needs. And that's what we did. We sat down with, with uh, educators, we sat down with vocational trainers and we said, what do you need? What is it that a person has, what's the skill set? That is going to get a person hired, and 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 that's gonna that's that they're going to need to have this this um this job with your company. So so um, we worked especially IVC right off the bat jumped in, and you know we're creating this credential program that that's going to help. It's fast tracked and it's going to help the um individual uh get their foot in the door. So we're looking at things like um lab technicians and operators just right off the bat. So, so that's where we're at right now. Everything is really in its, in its infancy, infancy, but it's moving so quickly. And, and the perfect thing about this is just everybody working together. You have education, you have academia, you have local government, you have um, uh, industry, and everybody's working together to try to get the community employed, to try to get um, quality jobs in the, in the door so that we can actually get our, our community um, you know, out of, of this disadvantaged situation, which we've been in for forever. So that's pretty much what we've been up to. It's been hectic, but it's very exciting. Um, and, and of course, we're looking at all the, since we're trying to get, that, get it done correctly, we're trying to see how we can make sure that equity is something that is at the forefront. What are the policies? What are the protocols? Have they been developed? How, how is hiring gonna be done? Um, and we are predominantly Hispanic, Latino community, about 80%, you know, monolingual. So that's an, a challenge sometimes, especially if we're talking vocational English and vocational math. So those are the things that we're focused on. And we're trying to make sure that we're addressing the specific needs so that we've got that career pathway. The other exciting portion is, is addressing this with schools. So you've got kids in junior high and in high school that are already listening to this resource and listening to this career that they can actually go into. And this is just the beginning, right? Because obviously manufacturers, so this is something that we're trying to, to expand. Um, and, and teaching our youth 
that there is a, a resource here in Imperial County for them, that they do have a future. So it's about retention of our, of our uh, uh, talent and, and maybe even you know, importing talent, right? So we've got something to, to, to give and something to offer. Um, what would be exciting would be a, a university here locally. You know, we, we're ripe for sustainable energy. I mean, you've got a living lab here at the Salton Sea. So all of these things are very important and, and we're very excited. Just a quick overview. Uh, th thank you, Priscilla. You guys are doing a, a great job uh, at Imperial County. And as Tim alluded to earlier, also the uh, potential on the Lithium Valley uh, and the workforce components that you know, we'll be engaging on too, obviously have a big impact in your area too. So really yeah. appreciate your, your efforts. Um, we will get to um, Bob's question when we go to the next agenda item, but are there any other comments or questions from our board related to Priscilla? Okay. Uh, Priscilla, know that you have a, a platform here to connect with us uh, anytime, how we can be helpful and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Support. Thank you everyone for having me. Goodbye. Thank you. Uh, so we are now at our other business. And so uh, I see uh, uh, Bob's a, a question regarding uh, board member requirements on Form 700s and other required training. Uh, Clemente has ex explained that uh, we'll be receiving an email to registers soon. And uh, if, if, we, if somebody has not received it and wants to follow up on it, they can email uh, Jeffrey Jacobstein and the email is provided in the chat. Uh, so I hope that that, that addresses uh, that uh, uh, comment. Uh, one other thing I just want to put out there too is I know that uh, it was uh, AB 3121, the Reparations Task Force establishment uh, that Governor Newsom had appointed. My question to uh, Tim is, where is uh, what's the workforce interface on that task force? Uh, is it is there any engagement happening from the workforce development staff or is it the labor agency overall? Um, I would just be curious about that and just seeing how, how we can be helpful because obviously that's an important issue and, and job quality I'm sure is an important part of that conversation on, uh, on the reparations. Uh, and then I also just uh, wanna mention that on April 20th, we're gonna hold a special meeting for board members who wanna learn more about high road training partnerships, high road construction careers, and our evaluation framework. Our next meeting of the full board is gonna be on May 4th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Are there any other uh, comments or questions in other business that anyone wants to say? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we have a, a prison to employment summit coming up and I wondered if, if, uh, if Curtis could just say a couple words about that upcoming event? Yes, please. I hope I didn't call on Curtis when he happened to drop off the line. It's a great setup. We have a prison to employment uh, summit coming up next week. Uh, I believe it's oh, on sorry, Tuesday. Jim, I was, there I was he is, on, all right. I was on mute, can you guys hear me? Thanks Curtis, yeah. Sure, so yeah, we have uh, next Tuesday, we have our prison to employment summit from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. We'll be bringing together a variety of practitioners uh, from our local boards, uh, you're here from, from our state executives uh, at the Workforce Board and also at CDCR to talk about kind of our lessons learned from the first round of funding uh, that we received. We'll also be able to provide a preview of what the second round of funding um, may look like uh, uh, coming up. Um, I think the solicitation is scheduled to go out uh, later this summer. So uh, we'll have a preview of that. Um, we'll have a preview of some of our early um, metrics um, from uh, and performance uh, from this first round. Um, I can I can just give a, a quick preview and let you all know that our enrollments um, are right around five thousand right now for this first round of funding. So uh, it's a pretty um, pretty good chunk, but not nearly enough for uh, for this population uh, here in California. That's highly barriered, uh, as you all know. So a uh, lot of exciting information. I think we're at around 725 um, registrations right now. So 
uh, a lot of interest from around the state uh, in this subject. And um, I know that Joe and Travis on our team uh, have been working uh, with all of our teams um, to put together this great um, uh, virtual summit. And uh, if you're all interested, I included a link earlier in the chat. Um, please, please join us to, to hear some of these updates next Tuesday. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Curtis. And uh, thank you to all the staff that have been working on that. Uh, that will be an important uh, convening next week. Any other comments or questions? And uh, Leanne's asking regarding the virtual or in person. Tim, do you, that's, a, that's actually a good timing given the, the shifts that have been happening with COVID. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Curtis, it's, it's a virtual event, I think. Uh, oh, no, she's asking about the next board meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the the next board meeting will be will be will be a mix. So it, we'll still have the opportunity for people to call in. Uh, so we'll have the Zoom up, but we'll also have it in person for folks who want to show up in person. So it'll it'll be a mix. Great. We haven't seen each other. <laughs> until. Yeah. So that's that's good. I'm glad Leanne mentioned that. Um, any other comments or questions? I just wanted to remind everyone that the Form 700 needs to be completed through the portal by March 18th. Thank you. Thank you, Clemente, for that reminder. And again, the email address, Jeffrey Jacobstein, is in the chat box if anyone needs to follow up on that. And uh, uh, are there any uh, general public comments uh, that were submitted from public? No, no, no uh, comment. Perfect. Okay. Uh, we will adjourn the meeting and hour and a half before the time slated. So everyone enjoy your time and thank you again for all of your dedication. Meeting is adjourned at 11.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you.